Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. I'm not speaking today. <laughs> if you're here waiting for me to speak today, yeah, as well. Anyways, today we're going to have Prophet Titi speak. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. But I just want to bless you with something that even as we were worshiping Honey on the Rock, I tell you, it's from Psalm 81. I just want to let you know that. We just don't sing, sing, sing. And then, you know, somebody actually wrote it from the king's constitution. And the king was talking in Psalm 81 about how, you know, when the Israelites were not following him, they were struggling. They were truly struggling. But he says, I'm just going to read, it's a long thing, but, you know, I'm just going to read from 11. Number 11, verse 11, 81, 11 says, But no, my people wouldn't listen. Israel did not want me around. So I let them follow their own stubborn desires. Living according to their own ideas. Oh, that my people would listen to me. Oh, that Israel would follow me walking in my paths. How quickly I would then subdue their enemies. How beautiful is that? Your king is the one that subdues your enemy, you know? Right? And how soon my hands will be upon their foes. Those who hate the Lord will cringe before him. They would be doomed forever, but I would feed you with the finest wheat and I would satisfy you with wild honey from the rock. Amen. I tell you, when you align with the Lord, there's more people coming there. Uh, when you align with the Lord, there's actually honey coming out of the rock, right? Like the Lord owns everything. What you see as a useless rock, there's actually honey in it. What you see as a useless rock, there's actually water coming out of it for the Israelites. Right? But you need obedience to see power. I keep teaching you guys here. Obedience comes power. Disobedience, power cut off. Simple as that. Right? Don't pay your water bill, cuts off. Right? Worldly stuff. Don't pay your electricity bill, cut off. Power is cut off because you're disobedient. So simple as that. So I just want to bless you that to know that you're under the Lord so you don't have to worry about nothing. Right? The enemy will bring things in your life to try and tell you that you're in trouble. You're never in trouble. You're in the kingdom. The kingdom is never in trouble. So you're never in trouble. How about that? Okay, just if you don't remember that. That's why I just want to bless you. That. And then bring up, uh, you know, Prophet Titi uh, that's been helping amazing stuff that she's releasing for the church. To be blessed. Let's give her a warm welcome. Praise the Lord. I have to confess, I almost didn't want worship to stop. It was just such a sweet, sweet, sweet. It was like honey. It was like honey. It was sweet. It was precious. And I just want to take us to a time of, of, of prayer um, just to honor his presence that I just feel so strongly here. Hallelujah. If we could just rise to our feet for a moment and just uh, lift up your own song before God with thanksgiving and honor. Hallelujah. God, we thank you, Father. We just feel your presence so sweetly, Father. We glorify your holy name. Father, we come before you, Father, Lord Jesus, as you've called us your own. Hallelujah. Father, we love being in your presence, Father. Lord, we thank you, God, for the honor to declare, to speak, to learn of your word, to breathe your breath that you gave us, Father. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We worship you, holy God. God, we glorify your holy name, Father. Your presence is so beautiful. It's so sweet. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to your name, Father God. Glory be to your name, Father God. Father, we surrender to you, Father. Lord Jesus, have your way, Holy One. Holy One, have your way, O oh God. Lord, let every word, every action, every statement that is made, Father God, let it glorify you. Father, let no one see me, let them see you. Let no one hear us, let them hear you. Father, your word, hallelujah is precious hallelujah lord how wonderful you are father you've chosen ordinary people and you called us your own hallelujah 
Oh, praise your name, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory be to your name. Father, I pray for every ear in this place, Lord. I pray that every ear be unplugged in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, let nothing hinder your word from going forth. God, I pray eyes to see, eyes to see what your spirit is wanting to show us, Father. I pray every eye in this place to be open to the things of the spirit, your Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Father, I pray for our hearts, Lord God. I pray for my heart, our hearts, oh God, to be open to what the Spirit of you, Lord, are wanting to deposit, what you want to us to receive, Father. Lord, I pray every word that comes from the throne room of you, O oh God. Father, as it comes forth out of our mouths, let it be as your, your mouth, O oh God, speaking to your people, Father, into the atmosphere, into the territories. Father God, let your word be declared, hallelujah, and go forth, and we know it will accomplish what you set it out to do. Your will be done. Father, your will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And the church said, amen, amen. amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Praise the Lord. I'm really, um, I'm, I'm, so, I'm so moved by his presence. And so I might flow a little different, but I said, Lord, have your way. I might seem a little bit however I may seem out here, whatever it may be, for the Lord's glory. Hallelujah. And I just wanted to share... Um, just some things that God has uh, been stirring in my heart through, through conversations with the ministry team, through things that God was just sort of highlighting and speaking to me. And, you know, it's interesting how God will confirm his word when you take a posture to really just surrender and say, Father, have your way, that he honors that. You know, sometimes I think we make things so complicated in the kingdom and for the house of God and, and being in his presence, we, we forget that he says, come boldly, come to me, come to me. I'm just kind of even declaring that right now. I feel like that's something he deposited in me as I was preparing this. And he's, I feel like he's just saying to, to all of us just to trust him, just to walk in him. Like it really is that simple to walk in him, to love on him, to let him love on you. Hallelujah. And I just thank God for what he has prepared. So I'm going to open up with uh, Genesis, the book of Genesis, right from the very beginning. And there's a reason for that. And I got papers flying, but that's okay. <laughs> so if we go to the book of Genesis, literally chapter 1, and I'm going to highlight a couple of verses. You don't have to go to all of it. I'll just read a few things, and you're probably going to understand where I'm going with it. So chapter 1, it's uh, lots of extra pages in this Bible. Anyhow, it talks about in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void. A darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3, then God said, do me a favor if you're okay with underlining and highlighting, just even those two words, God said. Then God said, let there be a light, and there was light. Amen. I jump ahead to verse 6. After he saw and he separated the night from the day, he says in verse 6, then God said, that's number 2, let there be firmament in the midst of the waters. Let it divide the waters and waters from the waters. I jump to verse 9 again. Then God said, let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place and let the dry land appear, and it was so. Verse 11, then God said, let the earth bring forth grass and herb that the yields seed and the fruit tree that yields fruit according to its kind. We jump ahead, it says, and it was so. Verse 14, then God said, let there be lights in the ferment of the heavens to divide the day from the night and let them be for signs and scenes and for days and years and seasons. And it was so. 
I jump ahead and it continues on to say, God said, God said, but when you jump to 24, then God said again, let the earth bring forth the living creatures according to its kind, cattle, creeping thing, beast of the earth, each according to his kind, and it was so. But something beautiful and special happens in verse 26, come on. Then God said, what did he say? He said, let us make man in whose image? God's image. He says, in our image, according to our likeness, let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds, the air, and over the cattle, over all the earth, over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, obviously in a godly way, and nothing creepy, don't stare too long, but if, just take a look around you. Like, just look around you, hey? Each person is reflecting an image of the Most High God. Like, can we just, I can't even grasp that, right? You know what I mean? Like, we're in the image of him by his spoken word. He said, let us. And it was so. Let us, and it was so. Let us, and it was so. And then verse 26, he calls unto himself and says, let us. Oh, my God. I pray I can get through this message. So please pray for me. <laughs> let us. It's important that we have that foundation. We've been learning about the kingdom. We've been learning about the importance of recognizing the beginning and where we're trying to get to, and everything in between is the means to the end. And so to understand where I'm about to go in this, I felt it fitting as I prayed, and the Lord put that in my heart, to start from the beginning. We talk a lot about identity, but how do we understand identity if we've forgotten in whose image and likeness? Amen? Chapter 2. Verse 7 says something powerful. Chapter 2, verse 7. If you have your Bibles with you, take a look at this. <clears throat> and it says in chapter 2, verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground. And something so powerful that's not mentioned anywhere else in the way it is mentioned here. And he said he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. Do me a favor. By the way, I'm all about like metaphors and participatory and exercising, moving around. So just close your eyes with me and just take one deep breath. Like, have we ever really just took the time to appreciate the fact that we can breathe? Yeah, that every breath, you know, New Age try to make it something like concentrate on your breath. They don't even give glory to the one who gave him that breath. They don't understand what they're doing. But when we take this breath, like when we grasp the, and I have no words to describe this, but just how awesome it is that we're breathing. Some of you may have been in a hospital before or know of a loved one in a hospital before. I've visited people in hospitals before where they could not breathe. We take for granted just casually. It's, it's one of the, we have nurses in here, right? Automatic, there's, there's a word for it. Talk to me, nurses. What's the, what's the word? There's a word for it. When, you're, when you can just breathe naturally, not thinking about it. There's a word. Like, I'm putting everyone on. <laughs> there, there's a medical terminology for it, but I'm sure someone will not be able to come to it. But it, it, it's about automatically being able to breathe. It's not something you're thinking about, right? You may ask yourself to move your hand or to do something, but with breathing, it's, it's just natural, unless you intend to force yourself to hold your breath, right? Breathing breath he gave us. 
it came from him. Now, just to break down, I really enjoy uh, word studies. So, the word breath here is talking about to blow, breathe, seething, blown, loose, snuff, to give up, to breathe, blow, sniff, seethe, is talking about breath and where life comes from. When we look at Colossians 1, verse 9 to 23, I'm going to make the connection to Genesis in a minute. Colossians 1, verse 9 to 23. It says, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his wisdom his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that you walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, being fruitful in every good work, increasing the knowledge of God, strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience and long suffering with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of his inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of, his, of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. He is the image of the invisible God, listen to this, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created. Do all recognize this verse? All things were created that are in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things. And in him all things consist. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. That is all things he may have the preeminence. Now that word preeminence is speaking of highly distinguished, outstanding, standing out among all others because of superiority in field or activity. Everything that was made, that could be made, came from the Most High God. And there's a reason I'm going to set this foundation. I felt it was, um, as I was talking with the Lord, He brought this to my mind about identity. When you think about understanding where we came from, how we came about, the breath that we breathe, the things that we do for the Lord, it's important that we understand that he is the beginning and the end. He started everything. Everything that we know today, he is the first. He is the first from the dead. He is the first from the beginning. All things that were created came from him. Lastly, I want to set this other foundation. It's all coming back to, again, the breath. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17 says, All scripture is given by what? What's it say? 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 to 17. What's this word right here? Inspiration. Inspiration. Amen. When you look at the word inspiration or to inspire, check this out. Inspiration of God. Also meaning divinely breathed in. Come on now. Oh, the awesomeness of God. (laughs) The awesomeness of God. So another way if you want to also see the scripture when it says that it's inspired of God is breathed in. We read that everything that was made, he said, he said, and it was. He said, and it became so, right? And this breath that spoke all that we see in existence, he breathed into us. He said, let, th- let us make man in our own image. And then he went as far as deposited his breath in us. Glory be to God. Glory be to God. Matthew 4, verse 4. Sorry, I should prepare you. I'm going to be jumping around a lot with scripture. 
Matthew 4, verse 4. If you're able to turn to that with me. Matthew 4, verse 4. It reads, and if someone finds it in their Bible, they can read it with me too as well. Matthew 4, verse 4. Anyone found it? Want to read it out loud? Go for it, yeah. But Jesus told him, No, the scriptures say people do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Amen, amen. Did you see the last words there? By every word that proceeds from who? the mouth of God. Okay. Keep, I'm literally just laying a foundation right now. I haven't even touched the main part of the, script of the message here. Okay, so we have everything that was made came from God. We got that established. He was from the beginning. We have God said and it was. We have the breath of God, the breath of life. We have an understanding that we came from him, that we're made in his image and his likeness. We have an understanding that he breathed into our nostrils the breath of life. Then we come into scripture and it says, all scripture from Genesis to Revelation, and there's many, many, many more books as the word also describes, enough to fill the sea. But all the scripture is given by the inspiration or breathed in. And it says, it is profitable for doctrine or teaching, for reproof, for correction, instruction. Instruction in what? In righteousness, his righteousness. Verse 17, why? That the man of God may be complete thoroughly equipped for every good work. If you're asking the Lord, God, how do I go about whatever the task that's in front of you? Or perhaps the Lord is giving you a calling and gives you a revelation of something. You think, well, God, how am I going to do this? According to what we just read, you've been equipped with every good work if we go into his presence, into his word and allow him to breathe on us and remind us of his word. Inspiration of God. Matthew 4, verse 4 says, Every word that comes from the mouth of God. Keep that underline in the back of your mind. When you prophesy, you might begin to get a sense of where I'm building to. (laughs) When you prophesy, not if, but when, Romans 12, verse 6, having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, why do I say when you prophesy? Because the word of God that I've read and I'm sure you've read, you recognize, if I'm to say this, where it's coming from. I shall pour out my spirit upon who? All flesh. Amen. And what? Talk to me. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Hallelujah. Why? Because the breath of God has been breathed in you, and he wants you to declare whose word? His word. Hallelujah. We're not declaring our word, right? I, I really felt to share this because sometimes I think we over sensationalize the prophet or the the whatever calling you want to put on it. But the Bible I read said that we all can. Now, yes, there's different offices. That's for another topic. And different levels of authority. That's for another topic. But I just want to just set the tone of building the foundation of who we are, whose we are, and the breath of life and the purposes and why he gave us his word and his breath and how we, by right of being his child, son, daughter, can go before him to hear him speak to us. Amen. Hallelujah. 
In word study, if you look up prophecy in Hebrew, it will come up as a prediction or spoken or written prophecy. If you expand on that in the Greek, it would go into a description of a discourse or another way of saying that a serious, lengthy speech, a piece of writing about a topic coming from or emanating from divine, and here's the word, inspiration. In other words, God breathed. Hallelujah. Divine inspiration and declaring the purposes of God, whether by reproving and admonishing the wicked or comforting the afflicted or revealing the things hidden, especially for foretelling future events. It is also for um, the prediction of events relating to Christ's kingdom and its speedy triumph, together with the consolation and admonition pertaining to it, the spirit of prophecy, the divine mind to which the prophetic faculty is due. It's the endowment of speech of the Christian teachers, also could be called prophets in this context, gifts and utterances of the prophets, the predictions of the works of which set apart to teach the gospel will accomplish for the kingdom of Christ. Hallelujah. Now, here's what I think is so important for us to grasp this, and not that I'm saying that God can't give personal uh, uh, prophetic word, but even in that, the whole purpose of that is to go back to him, give him the glory for his purposes. When you look throughout, very re- not that you don't see a lot of personal prophecy, you will see that, but primarily it's more about like what's on the heart of the Father, what is he saying right now for his kingdom, for his glory. So again, to expand on prophecy or prophesy, to speak or sing by inspiration, again, to breathe. Has anyone found themselves just, you know, what may seem random, singing a song unto the Lord? God puts something on your heart and begin to sing. You're prophesying. You're worshiping him. You're glorifying him. He's pouring his spirit in you, and, it, and his love just draws out a song. So, I guess you want to know the name of the topic. <laughs> the topic is called God Inspired, Speaking His Words. Speaking His Words. I'll be honest with you, I fought with different ways of how to call this. Um, there's so many different ways you can refer to this message. But a couple of things I want to talk to you about. One is identity. The other is intimacy. Or, if you feel more inclined, knowing him. See, so many times people, without understanding who they are and who they are, want to take speaking God's word. But when you do that without understanding where you are, you lead into error. And I'll explain how that could be. Likewise, you may have a sense of who you are, which you may think you do, but when there's a lack of really knowing him, also can set up for error. Why? Because the word of God, when, the spirit of God would never speak contrary to the word of God. It's it, like you can't separate it. We just established he spoke and it was. He spoke and it became. He spoke, he breathed life into you. So whatever we speak must be in alignment with his word because it says all scriptures is inspired or breathed by. Come on now, right? So when things, how you know whether it's of the Lord, it's okay, well, God, is this your spirit, Lord? Do you recognize him in the message being spoken? It says, my sheep know what? My voice right? How do they know his voice? Well, I don't know if anyone's been a shepherd here, (laughs) literally, Um, but I've done some studies about it or have conversations about it, and apparently the sheep spend time, if I'm not mistaken, maybe even sleep with the sheep outside to protect them. Like, they'll spend hours and hours, and they know, and they won't respond to anybody else but their shepherd, right? right. How do they know that's a shepherd? Huh? So we're compared to sheep. Now, sheep are not the most smartest animals. (laughs) 
<laughs> but we're compared to them. But one thing is, and I don't know who I had this conversation with. Who did I have this conversation with? About the fact that they can't, very, they can't see very well? Hmm. Maybe not anyone here. But anyhow, apparently, their sight is not that great, and they, um, their wool, you know, we see them on TV all nicely trimmed and everything like that. Or if you go to a farm, you see them all nicely trimmed. Their wool doesn't just fall off. They need someone to, to shape it, right? I mean, I know we use the word grooming here and, and, and so on, right? They need the shepherd literally, completely dependent. In fact, if, and I wish I remembered to um, this photo, but apparently there was a, a sheep, you might have seen this online or social media, of this sheep that got lost. <laughs> and when it was found, had like pounds of its wool, so much that it would have been crushed by its own weight. Who? that's another sermon right there. So Lord, help me to stay, <laughs> stay where I am about the crushing. Huh. Right? So here's, here's the this, this sheep, <clears throat> literally dependent and reliant. And when it went off on its own, it could have died had it not been found. You see where we're going with this? We're in a world where there's so many people that are lost, waiting to hear the voice of the great shepherd, the voice of God. And God chose to use you and me. Wow, like, I, I'm, I'm trying to get through this message, y'all. <laughs> I'm trying to get this message, y'all. Because out of all he could have yo- chosen, he chose to breathe his breath into us, and he chose to inspire his people to speak his message. Hallelujah. So identity is so important. John 1, 10 to 13 John 1, 10 to 13. I have it written here, but I always like to kind of turn to it too as well. And it might show up up there, great. Even though, I want to challenge you all, get into the practice of having your Bibles with you just the same, even if it's presented, and just get into the practice of like finding where it is. And I'll say that for another time about why I encourage you to do that. Anyways, chapter 1, 10 to 3. Sorry, 10 to 13. It says, he was in the world, so referring to Jesus. Actually, let me me start from verse 9. That was the true light, referring to Christ, which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. It's possible to be made, but still yet not know. Jesus came unto his own. Everything that was made, that could be made, was made by him. Nothing was made without him. And he came to his own, and it says, we didn't know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. Verse 12, but as many, good news, you always want to end on a good news part, and as many as received him to them, he gave the right to become, say it with me, children of God, hallelujah, to those who believe in his name. Saints, may I remind you and me that we are children of the Most High. Right? Why? Because of what Christ did. When we deserve death, he gave us life. When we deserve the penalty, he took the penalty upon himself. Amen. And we know in in further chapters, it says that any who would believe in him has the right to become sons and daughters. It's adopted sons and daughters, crafted in, called his own. He paid the price. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It says in that same chapter, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, 
hear this well, we've been um, designed to have life in this physical body. But here now, he says, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Amen. Amen. So that was from chapter one, the book of John. And you can highlight, we don't have to go there right now, just take notes, but it talks about my sheep know my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's in John 10, verse 27. Praise the Lord. You know, I'm going to share, I'm going to share a dream I had, actually, some years back, um, that the Lord, thank God for his patience, let me just say, <laughs> thank God for his patience. So, some people, <clears throat> yours truly, can be sometimes a slow learner that the Lord has to give a dream and a whole conversation. <laughs> so I had this dream, very, very simple dream. I was in a car um, and I couldn't see the person's face. I knew that I had a passenger and there was a car in front of me. And in fact, it was an old car that I used to have. And we apparently were going somewhere, and so I'm behind the car and let them take lead. And you know how typically if you're following someone somewhere, you just try to make sure that you drive the same pace as they are. <clears throat> so we're in the parkade, and the car's taking off, and, and, you know, nice and easy, all is well, I'm driving behind the car, okay, all good, all good. And I'm thinking it's going to take a turn in a certain direction, and the car turns another direction. And being my stubborn argument self, I'm like, well, where is it going? Why is it going over there? This is the way. Isn't this the way? So what do I do? I take that direction. And guess where I ended up? Back in the parquet. <laughs> In this dream, the Lord has a cute little humor with me sometimes. But anyhow, being that you would think most people would take that as, okay, chances are you went the wrong direction, just follow the car. Well, no, I did this two, not two times, three times I did this. Yes, in this dream. So, start off again, driving behind the car, all is well. It takes another turn. I say, why are we going in this direction? Literally, three times. So, I wake up from the dream and I'm like, that's an odd dream, because the dream ended, and that was it. And I had a um, prayer meeting that night, and, and um, this dream just bothered me. It was just this simple dream. And I was like, why did I keep going back in circles? And I was just like, I was following the car, and then, like, I'm telling the Lord the dream, <laughs> as if he didn't know. The layout of the dream, I'm like, God, when I had this dream, and explaining, he's like, yeah, you're supposed to follow, right? And I'm like, yeah, because you're supposed to follow right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm supposed to follow. <laughs> like it was just like ding, ding, ding. <laughs> All of heaven's parting. She gets it. Oh, praise the Lord. Right. You know, the Lord knows how to talk to us and, and, and drive a message home. He's a good God, you know, and he, he's awesome. He is, he is, I know oftentimes we think of God as, you know, way far away and, and, and you know, at a distance. Uh, for those who don't know him will think that way. And at one point in my life, I thought that way. I would talk out loud, wondering, I wonder if anyone's hearing me, you know, and have these conversations and not really know. And God is like right there. And he used a simple, simple dream just to say, I need you to trust me. I'm going to send you to a place you do not know. <laughs> I might have you go a direction that you don't understand. Maybe you've been going in this direction, and at one point that was the way, but now I want to take you in this direction. And you're thinking you might want to argue about it. Well, that's okay if you want to argue. We'll just start over again, <laughs> right? <laughs> but how about we take the easy route and actually listen to him? Amen? Amen. So in Matthew 22, verse 36 to 40, <clears throat> here's something that I felt was so important. It says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. In, every, in other words, with every fiber of your being, completely abandoned to yourself. He says in the next line, this is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two. 
In other words, when you look at how we are to move and function, you will find this comes back to the, the, the foundation, the love for God and loving others. Amen. In Deuteronomy, you read the first, I believe it's in chapter six, it's called the Shema. You're, they're taught this even to their children in a form of prayer. First Kings chapter five, 11 to 12. First Kings chapter five, 11 to 12. I'll read this out. And it's just really four words that I want to highlight. And behold, and this is regarding to Elijah, the Lord passed by and a great strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind and the wind an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Hallelujah. Can God speak with the earthquake? Absolutely. Can he speak with the shaking of the mountains? Absolutely. Can he speak boldly and audibly and loud and to get your attention? Absolutely. Could he have taken me from the car and just say, hey, we're going to go in this direction, whether you like it or not? Absolutely. But just quietly, just, you know, you're going to follow me? I'm going in this direction. Are you coming? No? Okay, let's try again. Come back around, right? The still small voice. Here's the thing. In order to hear a still small voice, what do you need to be doing? Right? You gotta listen. Now, if I were to whisper right now, you probably didn't hear anything. But if you were to stand right beside me, that's how intimate God wants to be with you and I. You get it? Right? So close that even at a whisper, you hear what the Father is saying. Oh, church, the awesomeness of God, that's how close he wants to be with us. There is understanding our identity, who we are, where we come from, who made us. And then there's this knowing him. And, and they go hand in hand. It, you, can't, you can't separate the two. It, it, without knowing him, how do you really know who you are when we're in his image, in his likeness? Our very breath comes from him. So everything we do is completely and in, 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 in must be in alignment with him. Now, he gives us free will, and, and we, can, we can choose to go a different direction and prolong the process and come back around and around and around. Some people are really stubborn, and that's why we're compared to sheep. And, you know. Or we could be that intimate, so close with him, and to listen to that still, small voice. <clears throat> so we talked about identity. We talked about intimacy. Now, coming from, you know, looking at how prophets work and, and, and what the Lord refers to, to prophets, uh, take a look at Amos chapter 3, uh, verse 7. Amos chapter 3, verse 7. Any volunteers want to read that? Once you find it in your Bibles. <laughs> Chapter 3, verse 7, book of Amos. Yeah, please, go for it. Wow. Woo! Powerful, eh? You might think, wow, it feels pretty good. He tells prophets the secrets, the prophets. But we miss one really key, important word right before the word prophet. Anyone catch that special word? A what? A servant. Say it again. Say it again. <laughs> His servants, meaning we're serving him. Meaning we, we, we take this posture now. I'm going to give some context about sir. I'm not talking about lowly like I can't look at, at the Lord and, and in the sense of like being timid. 
I'm not talking about that kind of timidity and that kind of reverence, but understanding that we're here to serve the Most High God, meaning when he speaks, I listen. And when he says do, we must do. The interesting thing is because of the intimacy and the knowing him, he gives us a choice. Are we going to listen or disobey? He doesn't make you do it. But when we come to a place of full surrender, he can make us lie down in green pastures. <laughs> he can draw us in closer. He can bring us around about in a circle with the hope that we would heed to his word. Now, I want to compare something here. This was actually in a, um, in, in, as a reference, as a comparison. And it's actually the first time that I kind of sort of struggled with it a little bit. And I'll, I'll share with you first. So John 15, 15, and I get where it's saying, but I also want to bring another uh, flip to that. So <clears throat> it, in our, if you have one of those study Bibles or, or reference Bibles, they'll often make a link to something else to, to bring, uh, expand on the context or expand on the message for today. So we read in Amos 3, verse 7, that surely the Lord God does nothing unless he reveals his secret to his servants, the prophets. Then it compares with John 15, verse 15 says, No longer do I call you servants, for a servant does not know what, is, what his master is doing. But I have called you friends, for all things that I heard from my father I have made known to you. Isn't that beautiful? Now, here's, and I don't disagree with it, obviously, it's the word of God and the references, but here's the thing. Yes, he does not call us servants in this context. We are sons, we are daughters, but it does not mean that we do not, we, we serve out of the relationship. Does that make sense? Right? So we're serving out of the relationship. So just because we're not called servants and he calls us friends, that doesn't mean to get familiar with our mighty God and King the way we do with our buddy. Like, oh, well, you know, because if I, friends, oh, okay, we're friends. I can just come anyhow. And he says, yes, come bully you for the throne, but respect is still due. <laughs> and we still serve the almighty King. And there's lots of other references too, where even the apostles this day says, I'm a slave or to the chains of, of serving Christ. And so it's all throughout, but just want to give some balance to that context there. So, <clears throat> Philippians uh, 3, 9 to 11, here's a cry that the writer says here, he says, and be found in him not having my own righteousness. Philippians chapter 3, let me give you a chance to get there. There's just lots, so um, forgive me if I'm rushing a bit. Philippians chapter 3, verse, verse 9. Okay, it says, actually, let me start in verse 8. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. Or we have often been reminded, owner of me, our King. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, hear this, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which comes out of lack of not understanding our identity or a lack of intimacy when we try to do things in our own strength or our own righteousness. It says, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. It says in verse 10, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death if by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on. Saints, we need to press on. Amen? He says here that I press on, that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Praise the Lord. 
the part that I, I, I want to encourage that um, you underline or highlight or, or take note is in verse 10 where it says that I may know him. Like, this is after walking with Jesus, eating with Jesus, as son of man here on earth, walking with Jesus, eating with Jesus, you know, breathing the same air as Jesus, uh, going place with, with him. And since then, he's been crucified, went to the Father, sent his Holy Spirit. And yet, even in the midst of all this, it's oh, that I might know him, that there's a depth of knowing that it's an ongoing journey. Like, even just when we think we know, there's so much more to know, <laughs> right? To know him, to, to come to that place, of that depth, of that intimacy, to want to share what he has experienced. I don't want to go too far, so I'm just going to jump ahead. In Ezekiel, I, was, I, I wanted to kind of um, share also the humanity of, of prophets. Um, and I think that's important because I want us to understand that even in prophesying or, as, as you, or if you're called to be a prophet, that we're still, we're, we're still in service. We're, how do I put this? He is divine and he is whole and he is, he, all the glory belongs to God. Amen? We are vessels chosen, called by him. We get to speak his word as sons and daughters of the Most High. John the Baptist understood this. He says, I came to speak of the light or point to the light, but I'm not the light. And I feel like we're in this generation, in this, in, in this times, and we see it all over social media, we put so much emphasis on the man or woman, but we're vessels. And so I wanna, I wanna um, just kind of share the humanity just so we can recognize that these are still valuable beings <laughs> that God chose to use, right? God chooses to use us. But that doesn't make us extra special or extra more than somebody else. We're, in God's kingdom, we're his children. And so here's something really interesting that just stood out a few times. In Ezekiel uh, chapter 3, and I guess this is another uh, parts of verses 2 as well. He says, then he said to me, God said to me, Ezekiel, son of man, go to the house of Israel and Speak with whose words? His words, right? My words. The words of the Father, of the King, of the God Almighty. But here what I think is so powerful. Son of man. Almost to say, Ezekiel, don't forget. You were created. You are my son and I love you, but you're also human. Son of man, that's essentially what it means. It's talking of a being. Adam, right? We heard that human being, an individual, a species, mankind, right? Common. As a person. That I'm going to choose to use you. Not because of anything you did. Not because you're perfect. Not because you did everything right. Not because you reached a certain level of whatever you think is prestige or you did anything. I'm choosing you to go to this house, to my nation, to my people I've chosen, and to speak, not with your words, not with your words of eloquence, not with your words of education or what you think that they may understand or what you think they would relate to, but with my words. And if you read the rest, you said, whether they listen to you or not, and, and this isn't an option, by the way. <laughs> it's not like he gets to decide, well, you know, I mean, he could. Maybe he end up like Job. <laughs> but Ezekiel ends up having to do some pretty wild things. And I don't know much the prophets had to do stuff like that today, you know. But um, I, I find it really interesting that he's reminding Ezekiel, remember, yes, you are but man, but you're not going in your own strength. You're going with my words. And I'm going to tell you what to say. And this is how you say it. And this is when you say it. First Timothy 
uh, chapter one it speaks of when his spiritual father says to him, this I charge and commit unto the son Timothy. According to the prophecies which went before on thee. And he says, and, and it gives some, some understanding why he was given these prophecies. Not so that he could feel good about himself and feel like he's on top of the world and that like, look, God speaks to me. God speaks to everybody. But listen to what he's saying here. So that by them that you may be mighty in warfare. Right? Because there's a battle to be won. You're going, you're going to some places and you've got to remember who you are, whose you are, and, what, and, and stay close with the Lord. And it says, so for good warfare. And I'm going to wrap this up with a couple of contexts that you can look at for yourself as well. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 <clears throat> and 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10 describes prophecy as a gift by the Holy Spirit for the common good of others. You hear that? For the common good of others, for the church, for his people, for his kingdom, for his glory. Nothing to do with the individual. And when you do function in the gift of prophecy, how does it work? 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 3 says, but he who prophesies speaks what? Edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. To break this down, edification, another way of saying it is to build up or to encourage. Exhortation, to push towards, you know, prompt you, encourage you. Like, come on, let's go, let's do it together. Comfort, to soothe, to chair, to support, to bring relief. Amen? You see why the gifts of God are still as much alive today and needed today? Does our world not need comfort? <laughs> Does our world not need encouragement? Does not our world need some relief? <laughs> Does not our world need to hear the goodness of God and be reminded of who they are and who created them? Amen. So just to give some context about the humanity, and I'm going to wrap this up, in a minute. So Abraham, we talk about Abraham, faithful, 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 faithful man. I mean, he's written in the chapter of faith, so we know he's a faithful man. Abraham. Abraham has some concerns about, I don't know, getting in trouble with a king, so he said, hey, Sarah, look, you're gorgeous, so when we <laughs> get to the king, don't tell him you're married to me. In fact, just say you're my sister. Oh, Abraham, Abraham, Abraham. <laughs> right? And, and so the goodness of God, the mercy of God. And what I, what I find interesting is because of the relationship he has with Abraham, you know who would have gotten in trouble if the king had his wife? The king. <laughs> so the king says, he says to um, God says to the king, uh, Genesis chapter 7, sorry, Genesis chapter 20, verse 7. Now, therefore, restore the man, being <coughs> Abraham, restore the man's wife, for he is a prophet. See, he had nothing to do with, like, Abraham as being a special person or what have you. He's like, look, I've I called him. I, as a king, anoint him as a prophet. I need you to give him back his wife. And, oh, this baffles me. And he will pray for you. <laughs> I'm like, what? So he says, I will pray. let him pray for you and you shall live. But if you do not restore her, know that you will surely die. You and all who are yours. Come on now. I mean, right? Like you're looking at this, you're like, okay, so here's this king. Mine is well It's like, okay, she's available. Why not? Right? And in the mercy of God, he tells the king, don't do this. And this is why. In um, Genesis 37, you see Joseph. Joseph, 
I mean, he's given like, who a powerful calling. Like, you're going to be above your brothers, man. Like, look at this dream. He's 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 had, by this point, I believe, or maybe even shortly after, he is given like you know the the coats of many colors. He's clearly the favorite. He has this dream, and everything is bowing down to him. And he gets this wonderful idea of telling his brothers this, his older brothers this, right? What happens? They try to kill him, and then what? He just gets sold into slavery, right? They completely betray him. Even though he had this miraculous calling on his life, he had to learn to be humble. He had to learn to forgive. He had to learn to endure. Not just, oh, someone offended me. This is the world we live in today. Everything offends me, right? <laughs> right? I'm offended. I don't know how we were surviving these days, let me just say. But anyhow, <laughs> he gets through it. We know the end of the story. <laughs> but I imagine he probably didn't know this at this time. So just, just want to kind of, you know, give just some, some context. Miriam, I mean, Miriam is Moses' sister. She, she looked out for Moses when he was young, made sure that he got to the other side, protected him. Um, she's known as a, as a prophet as well. Uh, she, she sings unto the Lord. She looked after him. And then something, you know, shifts a little bit. She gets struck with maybe a little bit of pride or whether it was jealousy or annoyance, whatever came over her. And check this out. Numbers. In the book of Numbers, I'm in chapter 12, you'll see <clears throat> not everything that she would say, even though she was called to be a prophet, was God-led. And she, was, she had to be disciplined, or more specifically, punished. So much that the very one she spoke against, Moses, her brother, had to be the one to pray for her to release her. Just again, put in context a little bit of humanity, that just because we operate in a certain way, let us not, let us be careful to always position ourselves to hear what the Spirit of God is saying, what he's wanting to do, and yielding to his will. That is something that little two-second of a middle school dream where not once, maybe you guys are faster learners than I am, <laughs> but it took me a little while. But he was so gracious and told me to learn to trust and to follow him. Again, here's another thing. Uh, looking at uh, other characters of the Bible. So, you know, in, in, um, in the Gospels, it says that there will come a time where many will say, Lord, Lord, do not we heal the sick in your name and prophesy in your name and deliver demons in your name, do all these things in your name. And he said, go away from me, for I do not know you. Right? Why? Disobedience, pride, letting whatever enter in, human intellect or knowledge, relying on charisma, whatever the reasons are, Right? obviously outside of the will of the Lord. Balaam, though an actual prophet, and this, is, this story fascinates me. I, I'm just going to do a quick little a snippet, and then I encourage you to go back and read the whole thing. Balaam's actually a prophet, but he was an evil man. <laughs> How do we know he was evil? He allowed himself to be bribed. Now, he was bribed by a king, king of Moab, and he was bribed to curse Israel. And he tried, and he tried, and he tried. But God would take over. Listen, if he must, he would even speak to a donkey. Okay? So this whole thing of like, I'm not sure if I'm worthy. That, that false humility, you know, sorry to put it out there so, so intensely and so harsh, because it is. It comes from a lack of not knowing who we are and whose we are. I was speaking to me, I had to work through this a lot, <laughs> you know, because when we think about the awesomeness of God and that he wants to use me, like, have you read my story, <laughs> right? And God is like, you know, it's not even about you. So anyhow, coming back to this, um, even Balaam couldn't even curse uh, the Israelites as much as he wanted to, because again, the only way they can do that it was through having them sin. Joshua, Deborah, Samuel, the list goes on. So I encourage you, get into the word, read the awesomeness of God, recognize that he used ordinary people just like you and me, right? And yield to what God is wanting to do. If we have an opportunity uh, um, 
to do some uh, prayer and activation, just a, a listening to hear what God wants to say to you. It doesn't have to be something grandiose. Remember we talked about still small voice, very quiet like. What is he wanting to say into your heart? Right, we can go before God, our Lord and King. I um, had a time with the Lord, and, and uh, I just really want to encourage whoever here, if you feel, and I'm not even talking so much about like trying to figure out right now whether you're a prophet or not. I mean, there's a series of character and development and training and maturity. That, that's another piece. But as children of the Most High God, we all can hear our Father speak. Amen. Amen. Rise with me, sir. When I first met her, I just told her, you're a prophet, right? She was like, what? You know? And uh, the reason for that is simply like this. A true prophet always is looking for a leader. She's looking for a prophet. A prophet will look for an apostle because she's the mouthpiece and, and she's also, you know, heaven focused. So she will hear and hear. It's like a satellite. You know, and then get all this information from heaven. And she has to find somebody to directly implement it. And that is the leader in the house. And so that's one thing. Number two, she was just preaching earlier on in doctrinally correct. The prophet has to be doctrinally correct. And she has to be the one humble enough to say, you know what? The word of the Lord, you know, is the one that will keep me safe. Because anytime the prophet, you know, like a prophet sometimes they get to a point where you're talking about how, you know, there's so many people just going, oh, looking to man, looking to man. They will fall. 100% will fall. Because that's a trap and snare of the enemy. Because prophets precious to God. They're mouthpiece. And that's why, you know, when Elijah said, you know, I'm the only one God said, no, 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 no. I've got spares, you know. Like, you're not the only one. Because they're important to God. But, you know, prophecy, you're able to prophesy, you know, you have the gift of prophecy and then there's the office of the prophet. Those sort of three things, you know, number one, she's be looking for the leader. Number two, she's doctrinally correct. Number three, she's very humble, very humble. Not going up there, she hears a lot of things about us, but she's going to encourage us and she's going to prophesy with us to bring edification to the body, which is the saints. And isn't it wonderful like how she just shared her heart to us? I mean, how many prophets you know actually share that? Right? Most prophets just come in and bam, 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 and then off they go. No, that's not, that's not good. A prophet shares the heart. Okay? And then you as, maybe you have the calling of the office of prophet too. And you might feel like, oh, okay, well, we need to group together. How many know Elisha was hanging around Elijah for many years? And there were school of prophets that come together. And then over here at Graceville, that's, that's the heart behind it. To have the prophet have the prophets together and then they cultivate to hear the small, still voice of God. Amen? It's not about, oh, I hear this, I hear that. Yeah, well, everybody hears everything. And then start saying all this weird stuff, right? So thank you for that. That's wonderful blessing. And I just want to let you know, the sheep is so important, okay? I mean, think that the animal, the sheep has nothing, right? Kind of dumb, can't see properly, you know? But I tell you, in within the sheep, they have blood that will take away the venom of serpents. And you have the blood of Christ running in through you. Amen. So that you will step on the head of the serpent. Amen. Hallelujah. So I bless you that. Thank you. Thank you.